We're going to take a look at one of the old cameras from uh, Kodak. It was made during the 50s. Uh, this is the Bantam RF by Kodak, which is a rangefinder camera. Um, just basically just peep through the viewfinder with it and it just sort of gives you a little bit of a frame for what you're looking at. Uh, this is one of the few uh, cameras that Kodak made that was actually radioactive. Um, this has thorium in the lens of it, which puts off, uh, as it breaks down, the thorium will put off alpha particles and it just sort of releases into the air. It's relatively safe. It's not a very high uh, amount in here, but it is enough that uh, it was used to cut down on chromatic aberrations and uh, just a easy way to uh, get a better photo quality from back in the day. This wasn't considered one of their better cameras. It's actually not very high up on the list of quality cameras built during that time, but it was um, still fairly expensive. Back when it first came out, um, people charged around 60 to $65 for this, depending on the year, and it was produced kind of between 1953 and 1957, um, but it was still pretty expensive. So 63 to $65 comes out to about $730 in uh, 2024 dollars. So it's pretty steep for what it was. Um, it has uh, a focus that's just built in where you can work it with your fingertip, um, focusing in and out from infinity here with the lever. And then up on top, it has a shutter actuator here, which uh, before each photo, you have to pull this down. Um, it can be taken with the trigger by clicking it here. Um, it also had a, a cord you could add to it and have a, a trigger from the side to shoot self-portraits, that sort of thing, um, if you wanted to. But um, up here, you've got, get this in focus, you've got uh, the shutter speed right here where you can change it. Um, short to uh, fastest you can get out of it is uh, three one-hundredths of a second. Uh, then right here, my thumb is, you can change the um, aperture. So the fastest aperture is 3.9 and you go all the way up to uh, 22 to get the most depth of field you could expect out of it. But uh, really anything over um, 11 on this, you tended to uh, degrade your picture quality a good bit. But as most people use these for street photography and uh, family portraits, that sort of thing, they wanted a little more depth of field. So you usually... We're shooting at about five, six, if the light allowed it or more. Um, camera's pretty solid, even though they've been sitting around for years like this one has. Um, they hold up pretty well. It's one of the few cameras that the uh, fake leather backing would still stay glued to. Whatever glue they use was pretty good for the time. Um, to move your uh, film forward with it, to advance it, you had the option of leaving that down but you could also pick this lever up and advance your film by twisting it that way so it made it a little bit easier to get a hold of it there for your snaps of your photos um, sort of an odd way of taking the back off of it to lo load the film uh, this little safety catch here with it press that in push this down and then you could open her up with it in this removable door um, be a little bit aggravating to get back on but locks back down solid with it so once you get it on press it down get this back in the slot here push it in and then you can pull up on the strap and it locks it back into place with that little trigger there i'm going to test how radioactive it is with a geiger counter here and uh, give us an idea of the true reading on it use this Geiger counter here which uh, will detect uh, gamma particles beta and also alpha and if you're checking lenses for uh, radioactivity you want 
a Geiger counter that can get alpha on it to give you a little better reading with it. So if I hold this just directly over the lens itself, it goes from the normal um, counts per minute in this room is somewhere around 40 counts per minute. Um, with this, it depending on how I hold it over it, how much movement I move around it, it's kind of staying right around 4,000 um, at its peak with it. And the thorium element, this is only a three element lens. Um, and I'm pretty sure the, the element that has the thorium in it is the front element where a lot of lenses, um, movable lenses, the thorium lenses in the center back or the back element, um, sometimes the front, but, um, but these range finders, they tend to, if they did have thorium, it was on the outer lens. And you can usually see that um, by the browning it gets from time. So um, the element in here will turn sort of a, a brown tint to it. And that can let you know a little bit that there's a chance that it has thorium because over time they'll get a dark tint to them. Um, that tint can be removed um, if you put it in the sun to let a lot of UV light hit it or you have a UV lamp you can hold over it. Um, hold, put a UV lamp over it for three or four days and it'll tend to lighten it up and it'll uh, you won't have to shoot at slow shutter speed. Um, just leaving it in the window for about a week or so will do the same thing. But, you know, just one of the few um, Kodak cameras that was radioactive, even though it was back in the uh, 50s. And a lot of the lenses that you'll find, um, Takamars, that sort of thing, were produced more in the 60s and 70s. There really weren't a lot of people putting thorium in lenses in the... Uh, early to mid 50s and this is just one of the few exceptions and one of the few exceptions for Kodak in, in actually producing a, a camera that had radioactive properties to it. So just a little bit about the camera. If you uh, like the video just like and subscribe. I appreciate it. It helps a lot with uh, building the channel. Thanks for watching.